On this episode of Cigars and Sea Stories, Bennett, Eddie Lazary, and Mike sit down to discuss all of these crazy places that we've been to where we've either fought and created subsequent lore, like Iwo Jima or Bella Wood, or, and maybe this is just me, I understand that you're not going to like T.O. on a conflict, say, hey, push pause, I got some some historical sites to go visit, but let's take a river cruise <laughs> down the Euphrates, guys. <laughs> hey guys, uh, screw Ramadi, fuck that place. Uh, I want to go see the Sphinx over in Mesopotamia. I want to take a fucking river cruise down the Tigris today. <laughs> let's um, go see the Garden Viking of Eden. Come through here and uh, do river <laughs> cruises. No, I don't fucking think so. But either way. That's, you know, that's Mesopotamia, baby. There's ruins all over the place. Yes, the Fertile Crescent. As yes, it were. but shit's getting burned down at a fucking record clip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. ISIS well, is destroying well, that shit. Well, when I was when I was there, I was in Baghdad, east, eastern Baghdad, over by Sadr City. And, it, I mean, anyone that's been there, I don't know how it is now. This was back in 04, 05. But um, when I was there, it was just a total shit, shit show. It was just... You know, literally trash all over the streets, open sewer running down the street. It was just, oh, terrible. But there was this one, like, roughly fenced-in area that was, uh, there were, like, it was, like, ruins. Some, like, very old historical ruins of some, like, back when, I don't know, way back in Jesus' day or something like that, where, you know, people <laughs> right? used to build, people used to build, like, little, like, mud structure like mud hut structures so they still kind of do that to some degree but but this is like old ass ruins and like the entire city was just just a dump literally a sewer and a dump but this roughly fenced in ruin area was like immaculate it was clean uh, nobody went in there it was a good size area it was probably about i don't know four blocks by four blocks worth of uh, of ruin area nobody ever went in there uh, nobody messed with it um, it was just, it wasn't like, um, cemetery. It wasn't like a, like a sacred place or anything like that in terms of like a cemetery, but, uh, it, nobody went in there, man. Nobody touched it. It was crazy. Yeah. And I, I mean, we drove by it all the time. I would, I would have loved to have, you know, like pushed, like you said, pushed pause, <laughs> like talk right. out of the truck and go like, go check it out. I mean, cause I, I don't know. I, I think anybody that served any amount of time in the military has, at least some appreciation for history. You know what I mean? Right. Well, for our listeners who have been living under a rock, Eddie Lazary here, who is the founder of Changer POV podcast, as well as an army veteran. We did an episode with him not too long ago. Go ahead, catch up. Bam. So we've got Marine, Army, slash, or excuse me, we've got Marine, Army, and then we've got Marine, slash, Army. See what I did there? <laughs> See, yeah. I'm just the, I'm just the, I bring everyone together. That's yeah, you're saying. our you're our conduit, Bennett. I'm the go between. Right. That's right. You help you help uh, you help Penny and I translate our uh, militarisms. Yes, right. translate. It's well, we were just talking about that actually uh, right before we got on air. It's the whoopee. Mm -hmm. So yeah. and and it's a whoopee in the army. Right. But in the Marine Corps, they call it a poncho liner. It's poncho. Like, that's well, you it. know, like it's well, not. Do you know why they call it a poncho liner in the Marine Corps? Because I don't know if you've ever fucking tried it, but you can't wear that with a poncho. Like, I don't even understand what the fuck the point is. Right, exactly. Right, the new right? ones. The old ones had a hole in it. Yeah, oh. the old ones did. And the, but the like new that. ones, I mean, you still use your poncho. You still use it to line your poncho, right? You can Not still when you're wearing that. it. No, but, but you can still do that when you're using it as cover. Yeah, oh, like yeah, we yeah. call that a rain, like we'll call it a ranger roll, where we put our poncho and poncho liner together, and yeah, then just and, use that as right. a sleeping bag. Basically, yeah. the base. Right. Well, that yeah. But, he, but you don't do that in the army very often. It's just no. You happen. still have, you still have the ranger roll, but no, we uh, you know we had actual sleeping bags. Yeah. Or you know, well, yeah. yeah. It, we I, I, I have to say the accommodations when I was in the uh, 
army were way comfier than in the uh, Marine Corps. And that's just the truth. <laughs> and that's well, just the truth. The Marine Corps just likes shit to be harder than it has to be. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, for whatever reason. Because they, they feel manlier when they do it that way. Yeah, and it's like it's like it's like, hey, we got we got a five ton here. Yeah, hop on. Nah, fuck it. I'd rather walk like fifteen miles. Thanks though. Right. Or or hey, can we sleep in the back of the five ton? No, fuck no. Get out in the woods. Right. Yeah. But in the army, they'll be like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it's true. Hey, yep. Been there, done that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my so, god. Yeah. <laughs> so there anyway, you go. A little background, let's not, little reference. Let's not get too thick. All right. So, so all right. So technically, Iraq, smack dab in the yes. middle of Mesopotamia, like the the ancient, you know, uh, Mesopotamian culture and everything, where basically the capital was Babylon. Now, yep. they say that the capital there, Babylon, is it's like south east of Baghdad, mm -hmm. right? Um, right? But I don't know if there's actual, I, and it's one of those things I can't, I, I don't remember. I'm pretty up on my history too, but I can't remember if there's actual ruins or if that is just a uh, theory that that's where well, Babylon was. Well, I will tell you that when, when the initial ground evasion happened of Iraq, it, you know, Oh, um, it was like Ferguson on steroids. There was like tremendous looting and theft and all kinds of shit that ha happened throughout the entire country, particularly Baghdad. Uh, so much so that people would literally, they looted and stole everything. Anything that was not, I, mean, I, I would say anything that wasn't bolted down, but even shit that was bolted down got stolen. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the first things to get looted and, and raped and pillaged was anything of antiqu antiquity so like the museums anything that you yeah know, right all of that shit was uh was just looted and pillaged and destroyed and which is ter i mean it's horrible because there was a lot of historical i mean say what you will about saddam hussein you you knew to some degree he had some appreciation for for history and and you know things like that so he did have quite a bit of you know, museums and, and things like that to preserve that history and that culture. And all that shit just went away in a matter of, you know, a couple of months. Right. Yeah. So I guess uh, from what I, what I'm looking at is there are actual ruins, a uh, partial ruins from Babylon, which are actually Saddam built his summer palace right next to it. Yeah. Uh, which is, yeah. Which makes sense for him. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. um, I mean, you've got, you know, it's pretty, pretty, that shit's just crazy, dude. Yeah. I mean, you're talking stuff like Babylon was the largest city in the world for about a hundred years, but this was, um, 1770 BC. You know what I mean? Yeah. So 1770 to a hundred years, sorry, over a thousand years. So 1770, um, BC ish to anywhere between, 612 and 320. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Again, the, that's crazy, was, dude. That's freaking nuts, you know? So yeah, it was the central of the, the central of the world then. I mean, it was at that point. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, and then the Romans started whatever, right. but then the Romans built all kinds of shit all throughout there as well. And pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. So you got that. I don't know about Afghanistan. Do you know anything about Afghanistan, Mike? Um, so we studied Afghanistan. It's kind of odd. Like as an advisor, they give you a history lesson, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, frankly, anybody who's in the military should get the same history lesson on where they're going to as far as a battlefield. Right. Um, everybody from Alexander the Great to Great Britain <laughs> and Russia, no one has ever been able to conquer Afghanistan uh, oh, because of, of the way that it's split up by the Hindu Kush mountain range. And that actually used to be the center of the kingdom. It was brilliant how they set that up. Just, yeah. What's going on in the background there? I can hear something like shh, shh, shh. I think Ed is filing <laughs> his nails. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> nails. I'm filing my nails. My bad. <laughs> Are you serious? This is not a manicure time. 
That's right, so fuck I, know, I, know, I know you soaked in a salt float yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, oh, hot, so, yeah. Uh, he's, oh just, he's just pampering it up a little bit. So think, speaking of speaking <laughs> of like that type of thing, though. All right, so you've got like the Dead Sea in Israel, right? Yeah. So uh-huh. they make all these freaking, um, you know, and uh, see, I see how I'm tying this into historical freaking spots. All right. right, so you've got the Dead Sea, which is one of the saltiest places on Earth, right? Right. Um, yeah. And they 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 actually mine or or don't don't really mine, but they pull the the salt from the Dead Sea and make like cosmetics and all kinds of stuff with it, right? Um, and different stuff. Well, yesterday Eddie and I went to this uh it's called flotation therapy. Yeah, like an isolation chamber. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it's like like off that show the fringe or whatever, you know, you 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 pick your pick pick your your poison there. But um it's an isolation chamber with like ten inches of water filled with like eight hundred pounds of Epsom salt. Right. I, so I, I would I would pee so bad in there. Uh. Yeah, right. So then, so then, so it's the temperature of the water is right around probably, you know, right around like 98, 99. Yeah. And, you know, so it's right there with your body temp. You climb in and you literally go weightless. Yeah. And you float in this tank. You shut the door. You shut off the lights. I had earplugs in. Literally, it was like being back in a womb. And not that I remember what it was like being in a womb. <laughs> right. Um, but I, this is probably what a spacious womb would feel like. Okay. Yeah. So you're literally floating on top of this water. And man, it was an experience. It was badass. Um, but uh, you said, oh, dude, crazy. Just good stuff, man. And and I highly recommend it to any uh, veterans out there that are just need a little bit of calm in their life. Yeah. It Get was in definitely, there. And... Uh, yeah, it's definitely a different experience. For you. You're in there for 90 minutes. And you're in there and your eyes could be open. They could be closed. You wouldn't know the difference either way. And you can't hear anything but your heart beating and your own breath. And I couldn't tell whether I was sleeping or not sleeping. It was just weird. It was just kind of a very strange experience. But so my, like, you know, go ahead, Eddie. I was gonna say it was like all of a sudden the the soft music started to play, which indicated that it was over. And I'll, it, yeah, and I felt like I felt like I was in there for maybe fifteen minutes. You know what I mean? It was weird. Nice. So you know, like. Mike, we've talked about like the six phase meditation, um, you know, it. so I did one of those, right? I did like a, and that takes about 20 minutes. So I sat there and I meditated and that was awesome. It was one of the best sessions that I've ever had. And then laid there for like an hour that literally went by like it was 10 minutes, maybe it the, and, and I literally didn't know Eddie hit the nail on the head. I, it's almost like I didn't know if I was awake or asleep. I just knew all of a sudden the soft music came on and felt great when I was done, mm. but it was just like, holy hell, man, just crazy. So nice. anyway, that's a good little, it's a good little sidetrack. I'm not going to lie. I, yeah, uh, so I was thinking about doing just, some immersion myself. <laughs> yeah. So just got, got a, and I'm, if you guys can uh, find a spot and not buy you go out and I, and I highly recommend you uh, um, do it, man. And uh, I think it's, I think it's going to be a pretty huge uh, thing, especially for veterans therapy wise, yeah. um, going forward. So yeah, man. Well, and you were mentioning stuff. So a lot of these different treatments are ancient treatments that are now yes, coming correct. into like modern technology, right? Because we have right. the ability to replicate this ancient treatment that could only be done in the Dead Sea or. I was I was watching this special the other day. Really high salinity, right? Right. Well, but I was watching this special the other day on some of the other temples. I don't know. It was a documentary. I want to say it was the Great Pyramids, or the the Pyramid Code was the name of it. And it and it was talking about the other adjacent temples, not just the pyramids, right? Oh yeah, yeah. The pyramids themselves, they believe in this special uh, with some sort of machine. Uh, but that's beside the point. So they talk about the temples and they, they talk about the inside where the hieroglyphs are and everything else. And they're like, the inside of the pyramids don't have any hieroglyphs. 
whereas the inside of the temples has hieroglyphs, and these hieroglyphs are talking about medicinal ways of treating somebody through vibration. And they they discuss this. Again, it's pyramid code. It's fascinating to me because I'm a nerd for all of this stuff. But the physician, the physician puts the patient on an isolation table that's basically like an altar of sorts. There are stairs going up either side, and then the patient is in the middle, and there are slits on either side of the room where noise can be introduced in order to create a sensation of vibration or, or excuse me, a, vi a vibrating sensation throughout the patient in order to treat them for whatever their illness may be. And this is also like a, more often than not, illness is tied to stress, right? So well, of course. rather than, oh, I ate the wrong thing, right? So a physician at the time was using vibration in order to treat and relax an overwhelmed, stressful patient. At, at least that's where they were going with it or what they suggested. So, which was freaking crazy. I mean, you're talking about ancient, ancient people who understood like, hey man, yeah, take a chill pill. You know what I mean? They were also talking about um, Blue Lotus and how they use psychedelics in order to enter into the spiritual realm which is pretty interesting. The blue lotus is used in a lot of different Egyptian mm. art and all sorts of stuff. See, that's what yeah. we're missing, man. You guys should have eaten like a goddamn handful <laughs> of mushrooms before you went well, in Well, no, they, they even, we had to fill out a, uh, a waiver before we went in there. And that was one of the questions is, have you done any drugs in particular, any psychedelics in the last 48 hours or something like that? Because apparently that could like really mess with you if you did. Well, that that's kind of, that's what, actually was one of the things that started the whole float tank thing back in the 60s uh, was a, a way to enhance the effect of psychedelics. Mm. Um, so they would, I mean, imagine taking like a handful of mushrooms <laughs> and getting into a weightless environment <laughs> where all you can hear is your heartbeat, dude. <laughs> You're going to see some shit. Oh, dude. I'm like licking my fingers over here. Like, like I'm going to take them blue caps <laughs> real quick. Like, you better get a doctor outside <laughs> that tank. You better have like electrodes attached to you. Be so that freaking doctor can like measure your vitals. Cause some shit's going to go down, buddy. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That's pop like, that's like some pills, ayahuasca. Pop a little shit. MDMA or, or, uh, or, or something like that, dude, it's on. Yeah. It, you know, or, or even like, uh, oh God. Yeah. Anyway, dude, you were asking <laughs> me, you were asking me about Afghanistan, right? And this well, is I God's think, honest well, truth. Well, well, Mike, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? You're talking about all of these ancient, like, like who, like we are, we today are so arrogant to, to, to look back on, on history and say, oh, wow, those guys were advanced for their time because they knew all this stuff. That's like, it's like no, like that shit's been like known for eons, and we're just now starting to come back around and realize that you know the positive effects of all these. I mean, I mean, look at how big meditation is getting these days, and uh, other things that you, you go into, you know, Eastern culture that's like been part of their lives for thousands, thousands of, years. of years. You know what I mean? Yeah. And. Yeah, so I think you know, I think a lot of these ancient places, you know, I think there's there's a lot of things like do you remember uh Mike and well yeah, you were in Iraq. You remember those great big beehive looking things? Yep. Yeah, but they were like bird like bird sanctuaries. Mm-hmm. Well I, I had like an interpreter tell me like like kind of some stories behind the existence of those bird sanctuaries and how they're used for different like medicinal purposes too. And I'm like, it's just you know, the, the way that other cultures, non call it non-Western um, medicine, treats ailments of all kinds is so different than what we're used to. We, we think they're crazy, but then you really have to ask, well, if everyone else has all these different, you know, ancient methodologies and medicinal things that they use and, and it almost begs the question, maybe maybe we're the ones missing out on something. Maybe we don't know as much as we think we do. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, uh, I'm sure of that. Well, for we sure. we I spend mean, too much time in the gray matter, and not enough time seeing what we feel about a lot of these other things. Also, like what mm. what I'm trying to get by. So being a Marine, huge spiritual bond to every Marine who had gone before. At least that's what I felt. I, I was yeah. if I was good enough to make it through and be a member of the it's, gun. It's club, what they try to create too, right? The Marine Corps. It's called esprit de corps, for Christ's sake. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> it's the spirit of the core. That's the whole idea. So so I looked at, I read The Gates of Fire a long time ago, um, which is the Great. true story from a squire who was there on the battlefield during King Leonidas's 300 men, you know, 300 Spartans, what have you. And this kind of like triggered, so I guess you could say... Hey, where where have other warriors of a similar background and hearing about how these warriors hearing about how Spartans trained and everything? I was like, shit, man, we should be doing that. You know, there was nothing there was nothing like weird or anything sexual within the book. You know what I mean? But they were talking about like I remember being a wrestler and on the wrestling team, there were days where you would do like um like you would literally just like pound the knots out of another guy's back. Like that was a thing during warm ups and shit like that. Or like crack each other's backs during stretch and warm up and all sorts of stuff. We never did that in the military. I'm not trying to sound weird, but like that's some of the holistic aspect of it. Like just getting your body cracked out and everything else. And then are you ready for what's to come? You know, we did our daily sevens and our stretches and stuff, but it was based upon a scientific formula, you know, and you're like, well, it's something always seemed a little weird there. Why aren't we experiencing more of a maybe it sounds weird, but more of a holistic spiritual sense? Like I uh, dude, can you imagine if Marines were out doing yoga right now? It feel weird <laughs> at first. Don't get me wrong, but you would have some badass warriors. It's one of the things that I that I and Eddie and I talked about this yesterday. I I feel like most guys uh, are really open to that type of stuff. Like like anything that can make them better, either mentally or physically. Most uh, you know what, especially infantrymen. Let's be honest. Yeah. Most or combat arms. Let's go combat arms. Most of them are looking for any edge that they can get to either be more mentally resilient or strong. Yes. And physically at the same time. So they're game to do yoga. They're game to meditate most of the time. They they might go, oh, this is all hippity dippity, but they'll still try it. Right. And if it's for them, it's for them. I, I can't tell you how many guys, especially in like the special operations community, how many guys meditate daily. Or how many guys go out and they do like yoga or they do things like um, uh, they'll get like alternative therapies, like going to a float tank or they'll do like Reiki or polarity yeah. or things. And this all comes from like ancient places, right? Ancient stuff. Right. Um, well, so, and you, you hit it nail on the head. It's always trying to get not necessarily the advantage so much as it is bettering yourself and sharpening the sword. Well, Correct. there's gotta be stuff. See, this is what tied into it because I really want to go explore like Karnat and Babylon and Angor Wat and Machu Picchu and all of these other different great places, not just for the beauty and the aesthetics of it. Like I, why the hell did they build a city up in the mountains like that? Was it to escape someone or was it because they had some sort of natural resource or, or was you know, it just what, fucking cool? Right. Let's be honest. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and then there's we like, built it for the view friends. We built it for the view and all of these pyramids all throughout central America. And then all throughout Northern Africa were built over top of aquifers for a specific reason. So, I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, like, yeah, I don't know either. Or, or, or like you bring it up, you bring out, you brought it up earlier too, is that we, we as modern humans always kind of like look back and go, Oh, they were quite, quite, you know, civilized for the, for the time. <laughs> right. So, but <laughs> there's shit that they were building back then that we can't recreate now. Right. 
Yeah, exactly. So what the hell are we talking about? Like, right. like, and I'm not talking just the pyramids or things like that. I'm talking about there's masonry uh, works like in South America, in uh, in a couple different places. And Mike, you and I have talked about this. Yeah, Eddie and I have talked about this too. That there are literally like you had masons back in those days that could do things that nobody. There's nobody on earth that can recreate them. Um, and even with modern equipment, they can't recreate it. So what's going on there? And I'm not, I'm not going to turn this into ancient aliens, an episode right. of ancient aliens or anything, but there's just things that we need to, to learn that we need to learn from just our environment and the earth. And, you know, I, it's this whole Gaia principle and, and, you know, you can get woo wooey with it, but those people were hooked into that shit. Well, you know they, what I mean? Like, and they, like, like you just said, there's reasons they built things in certain places and it's because of whether it was energy or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, there's just so much shit that we don't understand. Right. Well, and they're, they didn't have a warrior class. Right, that's some of the other different things is they kind of understood like I'm one of these people, I guess I'm kind of weird, but I'm one of these people who believe that there are different like breeds of human being. Without going down this weird eugenics pathway, what I just mean is I can't fit in a tunnel. You know, there's a there's a smaller human being who would be a better suited tunnel rat for that mission. You know what I mean? Right. Here's a moonbeam and a 45 have at it. I can't do that. Physically can't right. do it. I'm well, a bigger. We also know we also know physically that there's people that are that are predisposed genetically to do certain things better. And like like take who like look at the look at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Who are the best sprinters in the world? Mm -hmm. Or like right now it's the Jamaica right now it's the Jamaicans, mm -hmm. right? It's the Jamaicans and and people of Western African descent mm -hmm. period. It's because they're built for it. They, they, and, and if you go to Western Africa, those are the people that are built to sprint. It's the way that they right. are. But if you head to Eastern Africa, guess what? They dominate in distance, the Ethiopians, the Kenyans. It's because of the way their hips are developed. It's because of the way they're, you yeah. know what I mean? So there, there are, I mean, yeah, you can look at it in that way. I mean, like, well, but, uh, I've got, but I got big old thunder thighs and a thick red beard, and I'm supposed to be swinging around a fucking giant sword on a battlefield somewhere. I mean, Jesus. Right. right. I mean, that that's the type of breed of human <laughs> or, being or, that I am. Or you basically don't need an ox because you are an ox. <laughs> there you go. Right. So do you understand what I mean? So yeah. it's, the, it's, it's the division of labor kind of thing. Right. Um, You've got that. But. To but get back to our to our ancient site stuff, right? That's where coolest place you've you've been. That's like you would consider, you know, I'd say that that was built before one thousand A.D. Oh God, I don't even know. I don't know if I have been. No. Yeah, Eddie? I don't know if I have been. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think. Going back to something that Mike said earlier, it's the top of the show about um, almost picturing yourself in the sh in the footsteps or in the shoes of those that have come before us. I think the coolest place that I've been with regard to that uh, was a year that I spent in Korea. And even though it wasn't during wartime, uh, we did a lot of field training exercises, field problems, you know, stomping around the, you know the mountains of Korea. And I just remember this one night. Our, uh, we, we were doing, um, you know, movement to contact up against the different company and it was kind of like a simulated, you know, battle, whatever we had blank adapters, blank ammunition, things like that. And, uh, and we, our platoon kind of got pinned down and I found myself taking cover behind, uh, happy, happy mound, which is, I don't know for those that they're listening that may not be familiar, the, in Korea and a lot of other oriental, um, cultures, they'll dig a, a shallow hole and then the dead person is placed into this hole in a seated position sitting up and then the the dirt is covered around them and the, the dirt is continued to apply be applied 
over them until eventually you end up with this mound. It's a mound of dirt that's basically encapsulated the dead person. Uh, and and it's got like a, um, on the upward side of the hill, upward slope of the hill, there's like a small uh, dirt mound in like a half circle. And the whole point of that is as a runoff or rainwater and monsoons are very common you know, in that part of the country and part of the world um, as rainwater would, would come down off the mountain instead of uh, hitting the, the mound of the dead person and eroding the soil. Uh, they created this berm, this half circle, like smiley face berm uh, around the top edge of the mound. And that way the rainwater would come down and hit that berm first and then shed off around the happy mound. And so that's kind of where it got its name. Cause if you look at it from a bird's eye view, you look down on it and it's a, it's a mound of dirt with like a half circle, looks like a smiley face. So we call it a, a happy mound. But anyway, so I found myself taking kind of, and it was weird to be in this a central cemetery. Um, but it's not like cemeteries in our culture are very clearly marked and they're fenced in and you can tell you're there. But in, in, in Korea, they could be pretty much anywhere. They're all over the place just randomly. And so I'm behind this happy mound and we're, we're taking fire from this other pretend. And I just, I don't know why, but um, it just came over me. I remember wondering to myself, you know, we're at some point where there are some U.S. soldiers back in, in the 50s during the Korean War, you know, taking cover behind this very mound, you know, as 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 we fought that war. Because as you know, you know, that that the, the front line of troops of the flot ended up going sweeping all the way down South Korea, almost, you know, all the way off the entire peninsula. And then they fought their way back and pushed them back north again. And the battle just fluctuated from north to south several times before it finally kind of went to a stalemate and they ended up settling on, on the, uh, mm -hmm. I think it was at the 38th parallel or whatever it is, the mm -hmm. DMZ now today. So um, it's just, it was just a unique experience to be there and be in that culture and, and see the effects of war and see the, the rock drops and the, you know, and the, and the mine fields that still exist today from that period of time. And, and it just really, I remember being really, really cold one night out on the field and I'm talking bitter cold. I've never been cold that cold anywhere else in my life. And I was like really in the suck. And I just, one of the things that kind of helped me kind of push through it. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, what about the guys that came before me that were here fighting an actual war? You know, they were probably freezing their asses off, too. And they didn't have nearly the 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 caliber of equipment that I have to keep me warm. And so it just really kind of forced me to get in the right frame of mind and just kind of suck it up and just be like, if, if the guys that came before me could do it, I can do it. Too, right. Kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Right. Con. Taking cover behind a happy mound. Dude, you were taking cover behind a dead guy. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's crazy. <sighs> See, it's, it's so it's interesting because you're tying it in spiritually as far as all of our, you know, anybody who came before, right? And and being able to tie that across. One of the things one of the things that I like trying to wrap my head around is in that region in the Asiatic countries in Egypt and in Central America, they each build pyramids. They're each building them over aquifers. They're each aligning it with the stars for some reason. And then each one of them had a cultural society that, to the best of our knowledge, was somewhat similar as far as warriors didn't wage war so much as they were defenders. Right, healers and so on were a spiritual nature, all of this different stuff. I look at that and I'm like, is that something I'm not saying that we're gonna make a whole societal shift, but if we could better understand it and and I look at this through the eyes of a warrior who's looking at internally, you know, within our own country, we have so many people who are like pissed off at leadership, but they don't necessarily understand that they're responsible for putting them in and out and all of this other stuff without going into politics. But you look at it and there's some sort of spiritual degradation that's occurring throughout our society. And I look to the ancients now in order to hearken back to that spiritual time 
and say, okay, what were they doing right within a spiritual sense that brought all of them together? I mean, you have a massive city. It wasn't just people multiplying out from there, essentially, right? You had this massive city that's a collective of civilization, right? And then this happened in different areas. So anyway, I mean, I'm just, which that all happened a long, long time ago. So, you know, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, it's we're thinking a lot, we've innovated a lot, we've created plastic and nylon and Kevlar and all of these other different things and, you know, Higgs particles, you know, we've isolated what it really means to like construct our universe, but then, you know, on the other side of it, the spiritual side of it, I mean, we, we really haven't advanced all that much. We've actually gone way backwards. And it's only yeah, now that we're okay degraded. to talk about this stuff. <clears throat> so, because that's the thing. It's like, have you guys ever heard of Wim Hof? Have you ever heard of this yeah, guy I, they call him the Iceman? Yeah, I've heard of it. He does all of those breathing exercises, right? And everything else. Yeah. I heard him on Joe Rogan and all I could think of the entire time was that was like, those guys in Korea could have used those breathing exercises. I mean, you know. <laughs> I'm not trying to sully anybody's good name or anything. I'm like, much rather the opposite. Like, fuck, if Wim Hof was alive back in the day, we could have done some breathing shit. MacArthur could have gotten this thing over with. You know what I mean? I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I don't know. That guy's like taking ice right. baths and shit. What the hell is he right. unlocking within the genetic yeah. code that we don't know? Oh, have you done any of those breathing exercises? I mean, you're going to no. you're going to. Well, I mean, pass I do. Out. I do do stuff like that. But Jesus. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude, it's it's like you look at you look at a lot of, you know, you do any kind of research or study on on ancient military, whether it be the Romans or uh, the Vikings or anything like that. And all of them, and they're all different, of course, in different periods of time, different technologies, different weapons, different tactics. But uh, some of the things that they all have in common is uh, like their preparation for battle and a lot of like you said, they, they very you know, I don't know if it would be considered spirit, spiritual necessarily. I don't know if it really had anything to do with religion or if it was just uh, a spiritual connection to prepare for war, prepare for combat, right? Right. And, yeah. and uh, I mean, we I don't know if we necessarily have that in today's, um, you know, warfighter, but it, it seems like there's a lot to be said for the, the mental preparation and the mental state um, of the warfighter prior to you know you know going to battle or, or being in some type of a conflict. So, I mean, yeah, I think our technology has advanced tremendously in the terms of you know the equipment that we use and wear. But has our technology advanced in the way of of the mind in the way that we prepare for war? You know what I mean? Right. Well, then I think you bring up a good question, but I think that we need to kind of transfer ourselves out of the brain and go back down into the heart because the majority of the workup, you're actually conditioning your heart to be able to take what this deployment's going to do. Like, right. Your heart's got to be in it. Otherwise your brain's going to get all fucked up on the back end. Anyhow, right. you know, I was, I was, I was lying awake earlier this morning. Usually the eyes pop open at like zero five. Right. And if I can, I'll just lie there in bed. But I was thinking about this because I was thinking about the mental preparation and truth be told, I, I really believe that I was conditioning my heart for it and, and what needed to happen because I don't know about you guys, but I went pretty numb in general and could feel that like within my chest going like, I've got to shut that off now. We're going overseas. But when I was with the guys, it opened back up to a positive extent and a warrior extent. And my mind was now in warrior mode. Like we're going down range. We're together. We've got to watch each other. Six monitor your own sector, all of these different things. Uh, and I think that it's one of those where you're conditioning your heart to where you're like, people are going to die. You're going to be battered emotionally, whether you want to talk about it or not, but you really can't do anything about that until you come home. And I think that's some of the other different things in, in wars of past, you were on the front line for so long, dealing with all of this for so long. And, and it had to have been extraordinarily difficult in comparison to us where 
something happens, you go out on patrol. Then you go out on patrol. Then you plan for patrol. Then you kind of, I didn't want to say kind of, you do honor the dead, but you don't do a full ceremony. Then you go out on patrol. Then patrol. And then think about patrol. And then plan for patrol. Then you go on, and then you go on post. And then you go on patrol, right? So you're trapped in your head when you're on post and doing all of these other different things. But really, when you get home, you finally get to like feel a lot of the things like you're not just, whoa, going a million miles an hour. You actually get to let loose, you know, and it might be emotional to me personally. I'm a guy. I'm not very religious, but I'm very spiritual. I find spirit in nature all the time. I love walking through the woods. I love hunting animals. You know, I enjoy the reverence of that and, and feeding my family. Right. I find mm-hmm. a spiritual bond there amongst nature where I belong. Um, right. Other people find it amongst the waves. Right. You know what I mean? I'm not a guy. I do not belong in the ocean. That just, I'm not that guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just not that dude. You know, but other people find their spirit there. See, I think that's 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 kind of the biggest thing is like. I, I was drawn to the Marine Corps for a spiritual sense. I'm still drawn to fellow Marines, fellow service members, fellow veterans, and in a in a spiritual sense. I yeah, it's we tap that, and I I honestly believe outside of maybe religious fellowships or other, you know, uh, meditation groups or other such things, we as the military have the largest subculture, so to speak, of a spiritual bond. If that makes right. any sense, right? And so I just want to be able to like. Bing, how do we turn on this mechanism like this machine? Okay, now infuse that into your community. Go. I I don't know. I I think, you know, for me, Mike, um, I don't I don't know what your experience has been, but when I remember when we first when we first got to Iraq, when we first deployed, um, it was mixed emotions, right? Where we were it, it, we were sad to see our families, you know, have to leave our families and our children. Um, and what we were excited, right. Mm-hmm. At the same time, it mm-hmm. was a very Im- excitement, a very emotional driven kind of a thing. And then we get there and, you know, uh, all of these things race through our head about, you know, what's it going to be like, you know, what are we going to be doing? What are we going to see? Like all this questions. And then we're handed the box of live ammo and we're told to load up and we've never done that before, except for at the range. And it was very, very surreal. And so we do that. And then, you know, we move in the country, we convoyed from Kuwait all the way up to Baghdad. And, um, and we started to get into the reality of what it is we're doing. And then we finally get into our first two way firing range, right. With yeah, bullets coming our direction mm-hmm. and the shit is real. Um, it, y- your nerves are very heightened and, but you still, you come together very, very close knit group. If you weren't before, you definitely are now. Something mm-hmm. about something about combat really, um, I don't know, man. It, it it forges iron like none other, and uh, and then and then you get into this like weird spot where you're like, you finally experience fear for the first time, and unlike legitimate, honest to God, like you've never felt before, fear, and you notice, or at least for me, in myself and in my guys, I was a senior squad leader, and I noticed that 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 fear of death and and bodily harm and all these other things really started to have a negative impact on our ability to perform our jobs and everyone at their own point in their deployment ends up coming to the the same realization at some point and that is the acceptance right it's the uh, i don't want to die but i'm i i accept it if it happens it happens it's and the acceptance what it, of your own mortality Exactly. Yeah. Right. It, and it's it's a difficult thing to explain to people that have never been in that situation, because on one hand, people will say, oh, well, you wanted to die. No, I didn't want to die, but I I came to terms with it and I became acceptant of the fact that that was a potential. Right. And and once you kind of get I mean, like I said, it's 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 good to have hope. But if you hold on the hope so tightly, you can't do your job effectively. And when we finally kind of gave up a little bit of that hope and kind of gave into the fact that this is in fact war and combat, especially when you start, you actually see soldiers being killed and, and blown up and it's a reality, right? It's now 
it's not something you just see on TV. It's now part of your reality and that will always be part of your reality. And then it, you just kind of come to dirt terms with it. And every time you roll outside the gate, it, it's, you're still nervous. You're still, you know, uh, anticipating the, the what if, and you're trying to keep your head on a swivel and do everything you can, but you, you, you just come to terms with it. And then the magical thing happens and that's called two week R and R. Right. <laughs> and, and I don't know whose idea R and R was or what they were thinking was the not, now don't get me wrong here. I'm very thankful that I had an opportunity to go back and visit my, my family for two weeks, but that was the most emotionally fucked up part in my mind. I think I've ever been because I, I was at home home but my mind was not and my mind was on my guys with my guys and all i could do is just think about them the whole time i was home for r and r and i knew that i needed my i needed to be my mind needed to be where my body was and that was at home but it was that spiritual connection like i could sense things were going on while i was i could i didn't know about them until i got back but i just sensed that bad things were happening to some guy, some of my guys while I was on, on, on R and R, you know what I mean? And right. I, and it, it's so hard. You get into, you're talking about, and I'm not religious, but I am spiritual and you just, I don't know what it is that we call the sixth sense. It's just the sixth sense that you develop over time in, in combat. And I even remember going out on patrol and some nights we would go out and I would just have this complete calm, like, like I knew nothing was going to go down that night. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's not that I necessarily let down my guard, but I was like, I had this peace. I had this calm. Like I was, I was fine. And then some nights I would go down on patrol and I'd even say to my guys before we'd even leave, I'd like, man, the shit's, the shit's popping off tonight. I can feel it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, man, those nights where you just felt it and the little spidey senses on the back of your neck, right? then, you know, the, the shit would go down and shit would happen. And, you know, where does that, where does that sense come from? Where does that feeling originate? Like, you know, how do you, how do you learn how to deal with that or, or invoke that or, you know what I mean? How do you teach that to the combat force, or right. is it well, even something that's teachable? So, so you've got that you've got that energy you're talking about, right? Where, yeah. Where, and see, so again, it's more of a spiritual thing, uh, but it comes down to the fact that as, as humans and as living entities on this world, we're all connected. Okay. This is the theory that that I've read, that I've heard of, and that I thoroughly believe. I mean, okay, so you've got the you've got people that approach life as though they're like a machine, right? Okay, so mm -hmm. you know they just kind of go through the motions. They've got this. They you get that gut feeling. You know, follow your gut. You hear that. Follow your intuition. You hear that. But. Where does that energy come from? Like what makes you understand that you're going to, the shit's going to go down tonight when you go out on patrol. But then other nights you're just like, yep, it's calm and it's going to be calm. You know what I right. mean? Right. It's, it's an intuition, right? So I, I kind of equate it to the whole fact that here, here we go. And, and this is, this is kind of, <laughs> it's a little uh, different, but all right. So take your car for instance. You can take a car, completely tear it apart, right? And put it back together and restart it. And it'll start and it'll come to life, correct? Yeah. But right. You can't do that with a human. You can't do that with a dog. You can't do that with a with an entity. Why not? I mean, it's like, you know, you can switch out your parts and everything like that. But as soon as that life is extinguished, it's gone. That's it. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 So, so what, what it's that same energy that gives you that intuition that also is that it's that like that connection to that's like that divine spark that is within us. Right. Right. But that leaves as soon as you shut it off. Yeah. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? That, that that's the equate. That, that's what I always equate that kind of, feeling with is that we are all connected 
and it it comes from that that's the space it comes from is that that spark and, and the and, ancients knew how to tap into that correct yeah, i totally yeah, I believe so. that the ancients knew how to tap into that yeah it's, it's yeah. that expanse of of just knowing that literally you know it's like the mirror neuron uh uh, yeah, theory. It's just isn't a theory. It's it's a fact. I mean, they know that, that neurons, neurons that are you know related can you know mirror each other uh, on the other side of the globe. But anyway, if you guys want to know more about that, look up mirror neuron. It's pretty freaking crazy. But anyway, oh. um. So yeah, so it gets a little woo woo y. But I, I'm sorry, we're all connected. And when somebody's in a bad mood, you know it. You can you can feel it even across the phone, you yeah. know, when somebody's in a bad mood, you don't even have to look at them. You don't even have to talk to them. You know, Ugh. unless you're a fucking robot, which some people are. Right. Mm-hmm. But soulless, that's because they haven't embraced. The, you know bro. what I'm saying? Right. So um, or, and, and even then they know, you know, that's what body language is about, too. It's you know, it's the communication we we can communicate. I'm not saying that I can read your mind. But we know, you know, when, when you're in danger, right? right? Innately, right? It's the same thing. Ugh. You know, when somebody is nice for the most part, you know what I mean? It, as long as you tap into that, you're open to it. Right. I, I'm highly sensitive. I know when somebody's bullshitting me just because I'm highly sensitive to it. It's like they might on the, you know, have this facade of just awesome niceness, but in their heart, they're a fucking douchebag. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Right. And but but most of us, if we really think about it, and hindsight's always twenty twenty, but you you always knew it. Yeah. You know, because people just have an air about them. Period. Mm-hmm. So there, that's it. All kind of floods together. But anyway, see, there you go. Deep conversations. <laughs> That's what Cigars and Sea Stories is all about. Yeah, all starting with ancient ruins. Right? Well, well it all no, ties I mean, back. I, it does. It does because, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that the ancient humans, whether they be, you know, warriors or, or whatever, I, I think, I don't know, man. I love technology, but I think in a lot of ways, technology has hindered our ability and or willingness to connect with things that we can't explain everything's got to be explainable everything's got to add up right everything's got you know i don't believe it show me you know this whole i'm from missouri kind of a thing and (laughs) i i just honestly believe that we've gotten away from you know there's there's a lot to be said for things that exist that we don't see or understand just because we don't see them or understand them doesn't mean they don't exist do you know what i'm saying and I think a lot of ways our our warriors of past um, knew that. I mean, you, you know, you, you talk. I mean, a lot of it has to do with maybe a lot of what they believed was because they couldn't explain a lot of things, right? I mean, um, you know, the the Vikings and other other they had a lot of different gods, and each of the gods, you know, stood for something different, and it was a way for them to kind of explain things that they didn't understand Mm -hmm. right i mean there's no need for us to have a thousand gods these days because we understand things like hurricanes and natural disasters and you know all those things that is they didn't understand back then or you know how they came to be they thought it was just god was mad at them right that kind of a thing but i think they to to a large degree i think they understood more about human you know humanity and what it meant to be human and that and the connection between the human entity do you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. hell yeah 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 this just definitely got into a real weird like (laughs) conversation thank anytime bennett's on the call you know we're gonna go woo woo right (laughs) yeah something like that so it's what it is we're we're trying to figure out what that source so to speak is mm-hmm. you know and, and there's got to be some origin for the way that we ourselves as modern man feel or continue to progress it's an interesting conversation maybe next time we can talk about uh uh i don't know the the mayan calendar <laughs> <laughs> see if only they let us put 
push pause on war and maybe go have a history lesson in Babylon. I mean, it would have been cool. So, so. Well, do you know what? Do you know what I keep? Th- I can't help but think, Mike, and that is, you know, you see, you see World War Two vets, you know, um, go to Iwo Jima and visit, and you see, um, you know, people go to Korea and and visit, and you see people go to the beaches of Normandy uh, that fought there and visit. And obviously it's, it's many, many years later and they're, they're old now. And, but I can't help but think, you know, one day will it ever get to the point where you and I will ever be able to walk the streets of, you know, the battles that we fought and, and be able to, to visit the, the, the battle field that, that we fought in. I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever, I don't, know. I don't know if that will ever be the, the place where it will be safe enough to be able to do that, you know, which I think is kind of too bad. Yeah. One of the best scenes from any movie ever, in my opinion, is the movie Patton. When he is there in North Africa or, or somewhere, right? And he finds, he's like, I need you to, you know, says to his driver, I, you need to turn here. And they go down this, like, you know, obscure little road out in the middle of nowhere. And they come across this like ancient city ruins. You guys know the scene I'm talking about? Yeah. No, I have to watch it again. How is that fucking possible? Oh, it's been a while um, since I watched Patton. So yeah, Played by everyone Marine. should watch it. it. Everyone should watch it. Um, and watch it for that scene, or even type it into the Google machine. I bet you can can find it just that clip. Yep. Um where he's talking about, you know, he, he was a big believer in reincarnation. Um, and that he, well, you know, in a past life had been some like Carthaginian general or something, but either way, there's something to be said for that because he had a innate, uh, reverence for the past. Right. Yeah. Um, as a, as a warrior. And, um, I, I feel like a lot of us have that. Um, and you I've been in places, um, especially like in Sinai and when I was in Egypt and when I was in also when I was in Eastern Europe, like, uh, you know, I mean, you're talking ancient, ancient, you know, built by the Romans and built by, you know, the, uh, you know, different, different freaking cultures and whatnot that go back, you know, eons, you get a, you get a, 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 we- a vibe when you're right. there, uh, if you look for it. Um, that's really, it's like taking a bath. And when I was in Budapest, taking a bath in a, in a Turkish bathhouse, and I say it's a Turkish, it's actually a Roman bathhouse that was built by the Romans in like 700, right? Same freaking bath. That's nuts. That's, that's intense shit. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you're picking up energy from, you know, it's just different, man. Yeah. You know, going to a place in St. Catherine's Monastery in, in Sinai, which is technically at the, well, it's, you know, who knows what, what really is where, but supposedly it was, built, that monastery was built around the Church of the Burning Bush, which was built in by the Romans, right? Actually, it was built, it was commissioned to be built by Constantine's mother, the Church of the Rome, of the Burning Bush. And then this monastery was built around that in 574, right? So you walk through that place, dude, and you just That's feel, crazy. you just feel it's just that there's an air about it. It's mm. just absolutely crazy. Whether yep. you're religious or not, it, you know, it's nuts. So, oh. you know, I, I, I actually look for that stuff. It like gives me, you know. Those right. are the things that I that I look for in life, and I and I appreciate. It's like that connection, and every time I find it, I feel more connected. So, yeah, man, yeah. Yeah. just watch that video, and and you'll understand what I'm saying. Watch, find that that scene from Patton, and watch that video, and you'll understand what I what I mean. I'm not saying I'm the reincarnation of something, you know, whatever, but it's just that feeling. It's really badass. So, hell yeah. Give us your thoughts, listeners, your comments. Tell us where you've been, any of those other crazy ancient places. Maybe next time we'll talk about Bella Wood and Ewo and all of that other fun stuff. We need to have some guys on here who've been there. 
Like, I haven't been there before. You know, maybe maybe get our buddy Grant on here. We'll see. Eddie, Lazary, change your POV. Thank you so much for being on this episode with us. No problem. Thanks for inviting me on to uh, grace this awesome uh, <laughs> marine-centric podcast. I feel honored, bro. <laughs> right on. And listeners, if you haven't already done so, subscribe, rate, review. You can find Eddie Lazary's episode with us uh, later on. Back. It's it's in the deck. I can't remember what episode it's, uh, number it was. It's uh, episode 46. Look at that. He knows. Yeah. It was pretty early on. We're already we're yeah. at like 127 now. Bam. Bam. It's crazy. It's crazy. All right. All you fine folks out there in Radio Land, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Player FM, and anywhere you enjoy listening to Cigars and Sea Stories. Go ahead and look us up online. It's hashtag cigars and C. You can also just type in like hashtag add value. That's mine. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at cigars and C. Again, that's at cigars and C. Uh, thank you so much to our sponsors, veteranslist.us, especially to Heroes Media Group. Spartan Media is another one on there. They're the ones who did our fantastic website, a fellow Marino 3 company. So. There you go. We've got plenty of people to put you in touch with, listening audience, should you need uh, any of these fine resources. Subscribe, rate, review, give us your comments. They make the show, and thank you so much for listening. Gents, I love both your bodies equally. Hell yes. You need to know that. I'm going to take my pants off. And on that note, we cue the music. <laughs>